Minnesota uh, for all their tireless work. They're working above and beyond the call of duty right now. Uh, Mike Sipniak, Joe Arno, and Joy Thomas, uh, part of our University of Minnesota football medical staff, as well as all the men and women uh, across our campus who are testing our players, doing so much uh, above and beyond uh, what they've been asked to do in their profession. And, and, and they do it without asking questions. They just do it. And it just means so much to us, means so much to the university. It means so much to our football players and all of our student athletes that their leadership uh, with this virus uh, is really leading the charge. So I uh, just want to say thank you to all of them before we start. So with that, I, I think I'll just open it up for all of your questions and uh, we'll go from there. All right, thank you, Coach. Um, we'll go to Chris Long for the first question. Chris Long with KSTP. Hi, Chris. You know, Aria, uh, I'm sure it didn't necessarily come as a surprise, but when Rashad Bateman makes the decision to move on, um, I, I, I know you support that move, but what do you say to your team? You know, it's, it's almost a, a version of the next man up theory, I suppose. Yeah, well, first and foremost, you know, I think everybody on our team, right, is, is so proud of them and really happy for them. You know, I think we've shown where the University of Minnesota is headed with the type of talent we're bringing in here. A young man after his true sophomore year decides to declare early for the NFL draft uh, and be a potential first round draft pick. I think that just shows where our program's headed through the recruiting philosophy of what we've decided to do and how we've decided to do and invested in what we've done. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I've said this before and I said it publicly, you know, uh, my dream has come true, right? I'm a, I'm a head football coach in the Big Ten. I've always dreamed of doing that. I mean, my dream has come true. I mean, my next dream might be retirement. Right. And so it, it's as a teacher and educator, our job is to make sure that every single one of our student athletes dreams come true on the field, off the field, whether they want to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, uh, whether they want to be a stay at home parent, whether they want to have children to be the best parent they can be. You know, their hopes, dreams and aspirations are why we're in this profession, uh, not just to coach football, at least not in this program. And we'll continue to do that. The message to our players, as you said, was just, hey, listen, it's the next man up. Uh, we lost, you know, uh, basically 78%, and I'll get to that in a second, of our catches from last year. I looked at Mohamed Ibrahim, and I said, hey, remember that 78%, which we always still talk about? Coincidence, Mo? He's like, I think not. So for us, you know, we've got big shoes to fill in there, but you've got Chris, Os Chris Altman Bell coming back, Demetrius Douglas. You look at Seth Green. You look at Clay Geary. And you look at guys like that, and then you got Daniel Jackson and, and, um, and Doug Emelian, who are true freshmen that are coming in. Uh, and then, and also, you know, when you look at Mike Sanford's resume and what he's been able to do over the course of his career, he's been able to implement the tight end a lot more. And then you've got a, a deep tight end core right now that can be able to catch the ball and do some things down the field. So uh, it's a great challenge to all of our players. We're really happy for Rashad. We support Rashad 100%. And then we have a season to play. So there's a lot of catches out there uh, that are up for grabs. And it's going to be a very, very competitive training camp for that to be able to be distributed. Thank you, Chris. We'll go to Meg Ryan with the Star Tribune. Hi, PJ. Hi, Meg. Hello. Um, I was actually wondering, I know you said on the Big Ten Network that training camp is going to look different this year, obviously. Um, I'm curious if you could give us some examples of how it does look different, kind of what are some of the things you're doing since we're not there and we can't really see it with our own eyes. Like, How does it look different? And then as an add-on to that, you know, a couple of programs have had to halt their workouts from positive tests or whatnot. I'm curious if that has ever happened to you guys throughout the course of the workouts. And, you know, yeah, so those, are, those are really good questions, Meg. Uh, no, we have not had to halt the workouts. Uh, we have not done that. Um, you know, as of today, uh, when we reported training camp uh, on August 7th, um, there, not that I'm aware of, that there are zero positive cases right now um, on our football team. Now, this virus is incredibly humbling. I mean, incredibly humbling, right? Um, we don't know if we have it or not until we're tested. And sometimes you don't even know where you got it from. And sometimes you don't even have any symptoms. So it's a very humbling virus and it's changing daily. And that could change as of tomorrow. But I'm not aware of today, as we reported camp on August 7th, uh, any positive tests uh, right now. So I think we've started with zero. When you're talking about our practices, you've all been to our practices and you've all seen how fast they go and how much we take and how many people we have and how much we cram into about 90 minutes, it's very different than that. Uh, we're following all the NCAA, 
all the Big Ten, all of our state, all of our university policy, our governing policies, the CDC, and implementing our training camp. Our number one priority is the safety of our student athletes, period. If you came out and watched our first practice today, you'd be like, wait a second, that doesn't look like a, a Coach Fleck rule the boat type practice uh, and what I'm accustomed to. That's good because here's what we're going to do. We're going to crawl and we'll crawl for as long as we need to crawl, right? And then we'll walk and we'll walk for as long as we need to walk. And then we'll run and we'll run for as long as we want to run. And then if we ever get to sprinting, we'll sprint. You know, we talked to our players about three buckets before we even, when this whole COVID thing hit. That first bucket was going to be able to one day we're going to get them back and we're going to get them back safely and be able to start to learn the new next. Maybe not the new norm, but the new next. The second bucket was going to be able to get them to training camp, right, Safe, safely and health, healthy, the best we possibly can. You can't eliminate all risk in this virus, but you can limit it by what you do and how you do it. And that is our focus in that bucket, too. And then bucket three is when you actually get to the season. And we're, we're, we're so far removed from that right now. Uh, and I'm not concerned about, hey, uh, did we get as many practices to make sure that they were as sharp as they needed to be and what they're going to do? I'm not concerned about right now, that right now. I'm concerned about their safety, what we can do under state, federal, Big Ten, NCAA, university policy that we feel is very safe uh, and can limit the amount of risk that we have. Uh, and so if you came to our practice today, you would see that. And listen, there's not even a plan to put pads on until even next week, like a week from now. And that might even be pushed back. So we, we are going to do things at, at, at a, a snail pace to make sure that our student athletes are safe. And when you think about it, if it ever happens to, as Kevin Warren has said, been, it has options to be flexible and push back. Well, if it's pushed back, we have things implemented that we don't have to really start the real part until one, it's safe to do that. And two, that we don't keep our kids in training camp for eight weeks or eight weeks. Right. So everything's in to be able to adjust to the flexibility of this virus and the flexibility of what the, the, the policies are, but we're going to follow them. We're going to follow what our state says. And like I said, it's impossible to eliminate all risk, right? But it, we have to, as the adults, and as the administrators, be able to limit the amount of risk our players have every single day. And I feel like uh, our medical staff has done an elite job of that up until this point. And we're just going to continue to focus on now. All right, let's go to Andy Greeter with the Pioneer Press. Andy, when you're ready. Andy. PJ, you got me? I got you, Andy. All right, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to see, ask about kind of what you guys are trying to do to limit that risk outside of, of football practice. Obviously, you know, the teams have been successful, leagues have been successful when they've created a bubble. What is, right. what is the class situation going to look like? How are you going to eliminate risk as best you can elsewhere? Well, we've got to create a synthetic bubble. One, our players have had a lot of weeks to get used to a bubble. What happens when you don't? use the bubble. What happens when you do use the bubble? Uh, we learn from our mistakes. We fail. We grow. And then we're able to see the consequences from all those things that we had. So we've got all this knowledge and all this education now, and now we have to apply it. But this isn't the NBA to create this, you know, $100 million bubble, right? This is to be able to trust our student athletes that are doing that. The testing policies that we have in place are right along with what, like we said, the NCAA, the Big Ten, the state, the university have put in place for our football program. And as those continue to get better and those continue to grow, right, we look forward to those being able to happen. So when you look at what we've actually been able to do to, to minimize that risk, you know, we talk about this bubble, right? So we've got, we've got bubble, like literally like bubble guns, right? Shooting bubbles for the, for the irony and for like the, the, the image of bubble, bubble, remind them of bubbles, right? We got bubble machines and different things like that that we can show them. Uh, we got pictures of bubbles all over our facility going up today. We've had our team meetings. Uh, we had a team meeting in TCF Bank Stadium to make sure we could uh, spread everybody out uh, when they're standing around an individual and different drills. They've got to be six feet apart. Everybody has their masks. We're in a, the equipment tryout phase of our practices. Everybody had a gator on today, which is this, and see if you like that and how you like that. We also have kind of like snowmobile masks uh, that are really kind of made of a bamboo type material. Go figure. Coincidence, I think not for our theme this year, but that kind of just keep your eyes and everything else covered. Uh, we have the shut face masks as well to continue to implement how we're doing this step by step by step. 
We have larger meeting rooms. We cleared out our players' lounge and use that as a meeting room now. We've got smaller lift groups. We've got multiple practice fields. We split our team up into different groups that are practicing at different times. We've got two locker rooms. So there, and, and not including all the medical and the sanitation uh, that's going on. Uh, to be able to uh, make sure they're walking into very clean, healthy environments, as well as basically maps how to enter, how to exit. And I can go on and on about that. And that's where you got to give a lot of credit to our medical staff and SIP, Joe, Arnold, Joy Thomas, for putting those policies in place and working for our, with our football team to make sure this is the safest environment our student athletes can be in. All right, let's go to Chip Scoggins, Star Tribune. Hey, PJ. Chip. How you doing? I'm doing elite, man. Good to see you, kind of. Good, yeah, good, good, good to see you, kind of, but seeing you on the computer. Yeah, absolutely. So I listened to you talk about these practices and maybe not putting on pads for a week. Is it even realistic to have a team ready to play in less than a month? Well, I think it's about how, you know, we're all experimenting with something new, right? And when I sit there and look at our football team, Chip, our, our football teams played a lot of football. Do we have some newcomers? Yes, but our team for the majority has played a lot of football. Does Coney Durr need 19 physical practices to be ready to play the game uh, instead of maybe, you know, what, whatever it's going to be, 10 to 12? I don't know what that number is even as of now, but does he need those? Does, does Ben St. Juice need that? Does Tanner Morgan need that? You know, does Blaze Andrews need that? We were able to do a lot of things before we even got to training camp that, that help us mentally and emotionally play the game. The physical part, our players have done a lot of that. It's not like most of these players are walking into their first game ever. So to me, I, this year, when you look at it, my job is going to be able to make our team the healthiest team on the field, right? the safest team on the field, and the most prepared team on the field. But football is going to come backseat to the safety, period. So if we can do both and combine that, but if I have to err on the side of the safety part way more, that's what I'm going to do. And this team's been blessed enough to play a lot of football. And Dan Nickel, in the short amount of time we've had them in the summer, has done a great job of getting them in football shape. And our players have done a great job for the majority of making sure that they're in shape by the time they got here. So it, it, it's this player-led team that, uh, that you've got to be able to trust them. And again, trust comes down to time, consistency, and proof. And I trust my football team. That doesn't mean that we're not practicing. That doesn't mean there's a certain level that you got to get them ready for. But at some point, when you look at when the schedule's released and when you start training camp, I mean, you have five weeks, right? What are we going to do to keep them safe, healthy, the safest we possibly can, healthy as we possibly can, and get them ready? But this team's played a lot of football. And I think we can get them ready or, or we wouldn't be out there. All right, let's go to John Krasinski with The Athletic. Hey, PJ. Um, I had a, wanted to kind of get your thoughts on how you're approaching the mental side of this for your players in terms of, hey, you know, I think college athletes in general today are more aware of, of the, the things going around them. You see the Pac-12, you know, writing the letter they did, Big Ten athletes as well. And just sort of, you know, you know these players are coming into an environment where they are concerned about their safety, about their health and those things. And how do you just kind of try to address the mental side of things with them so that, you know, they can feel not only that you're looking out for their physical well-being, but that you do understand that there are probably players that are going to come in wondering if this is the right thing that they should be doing right now. Yeah, well, you give them a choice. You know, we talk about everybody's got to evaluate the risk at hand because there's risk involved. Uh, there's risk walking outside. There's risk going to dinner. There's risk playing football as there is with injuries. But there's a little bit more risk now, right? And it's not for me to judge whether you should play or not. And we're going to support you no matter what decision you make. And I might have said that a thousand times. And it's real and it's true. If a player decides not to play, he's going to have support from me. If a player decides he's going to play, he's going to have support from me. But what I've also told my team is it's your decision. Don't influence someone else to play if you're going to play. Don't influence them. We all have our own circumstances, and we have our own families, and we all have our own choices to make. But if you're not going to play, don't influence somebody who wants to play. You have your own decision. You have to be able to make that decision. So it, there's both sides of that. But again, if we continue to go and we move forward, we want our, our guys to be the safest they possibly can. Not only that, you know, we have four mental health specialists and doctors on our staff. 
And we have been able to make sure our players know they're provided that mental health support. We've implemented meditation in our, pos or in our position meetings to, to be able to focus because there's so much going on around us that we can't control. What I want them to do is focus on now, mentally, emotionally now. If you start thinking two weeks down the road, guys, three weeks down the road, th this virus is so humbling. And, and each day there's more and more knowledge that if you start thinking three, four weeks ahead, it's going to blow your mind. Think about where we were four weeks ago to where we are now. Think how much has changed. Focus on now. What we do now is being able to follow all the guidelines by the NCAA, Big Ten, State, University, CDC. That's what we're following now. I can't tell you what that's going to be in three weeks. But what I can do is tell you now and make you feel as safe as we possibly can now. And then it's up to you to make that decision. And that's what I've told our team. And I'll, I tell them that every day, every time I see them. And it's okay if you do not want to play. And it's okay if you do want to play. I'm here to support you. Mark Coyle's here to support you, right? President Gable's here to support you. We're all here to support you on the decisions you make. All right, let's go to Pierre from Fox 9. Hey, Pierre. Hey, hey, PJ, how you doing? Um, I, mean, I enjoy looking at all of your homes, too, when you guys do the sportscasts. I actually get a chance to see everybody's home. It's kind of fun. Glad you enjoy it. Um, so I'm just curious with, with Tanner, what does this year look like for him in terms of progression and the next step you want to see him take? And what is, you know, kind of the status on, on Zach after um, a couple of injury-riddled seasons he's had? Yeah, first of all, Zach's back. Uh, he, he's, I think the addition of Mike Sanford has continued to, to help Zach's development as well as all the quarterbacks. Cole and Jacob have come on strong. Uh, you can tell they were working on their own uh, when they were away. And then when you look at Tanner, I mean, when I sit there and look at Tanner's game, everything's got to continue to get better. And if I said anything one specific, I mean, he'd get mad at me. That's the type of competitor he is. He knows he has to get better at, better at every single thing that he can do, including making every single person around him better. 78% of his catches are gone now, right? So whether that's Brevin Span Ford or Jake Paulson or Co Keeft or the wide receivers, the new wide receiving core, you know, it, it, it kind of reminds me of a situation we had back at Western Michigan going into year four. And here we are having everybody back. We're picked to win the league. And Daniel Braverman declares for the draft as a junior. And he gets drafted by the Chicago Bears in the seventh round. And I remember when that happened, we're like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? We lose 115 catches that year. You know, he caught 115 balls a year prior. What are we going to do? And a guy by the name of Michael Henry uh, and Carrington Thompson came in, and you would have thought they were four-year starters from the start, right? So there's going to be people that evolve. And Tanner's got to help those young guys mature way quicker because we got guys in that room where it's time to grow higher. It's time for that bamboo to grow that 90 feet in year four. They've been here. But then we also got guys in the room that we got to go all the way back to year one with race to maturity, right? The Daniel Jacksons and the Doug Emilians, they got a race to maturity. They, you know, what you have to do has got to be what you want to do. And we, we don't have time to sit there and say, hey, we got a red shirt here. Hey, we got to do it. We got to get them going, right? When you have two first team, all Big Ten wide receivers for the first time in the history of the league, and they leave in one year, you got a lot of making up to do. Right. And we don't want to just rebuild. We want to reload. So they've got to bring it up there. And I think that's what Tanner's challenge is, is to get all those guys to be able to play at a high level and to get to know that he believes in them. All right, let's go to Ryan Burns. Ryan, when you're ready. Hi, Ryan. Hey, PJ. I was curious defensively, you lose seven starters from last year's team. You only get three spring ball practices. And with everything that how different this ball camp is going to be, how stressed out, and how with, is Joe Rossi with how detail-oriented he wants to be? I don't think stress is in Joe Rossi's vocabulary. Uh, Joe Rossi and I have very different personalities, uh, and I like it because uh, he helps me uh, in a lot of situations, and hopefully I help him in a lot of situations. But here's the thing I'll tell you. you know, last year with the Kamal Martins, right, and the Thomas Barbers and the Carter Coughlins, right, and, and Chris Williamson, and you look at all the guys who, who went to the National Football League, Antoine Winfield Jr., they were such a tight-knit group, right? And they did such a great job leading the group. But I also think that sometimes when players like that move on and go play in the National Football League, it opens the door, and it also allows you to take the jar off of the grasshopper jar, right? Jumping in there. And sometimes when those young players have all those elite players playing in front of them, they just keep hitting the top because they're, they're not going to play yet, you know? And they, they kind of know where they're at, but – Man, I'm never going to play, never going to play. Then you take that top off and boom, 
you see potential and talent you never saw before. But you look at Boye Mafe, you look at the offseason that says he's had, you look at guys like Keontae Shad and Trill, and you look at Micah Dude Treadway, you look at like a Cody Lindenberg. I mean, wait till you see these guys. Wait till you see Jalen Logan Redding. I mean, wait till you see these guys. Mariano Sori Marin has had a tremendous offseason. You could tell he was working when he was home. And then the back end, Tyler Newbin and Jordan Howden. And then you got two all Big Ten quarters coming back in St. Juice and, and, and Coney Durr. And you got new guys coming in. That's what's exciting when you're running a program and building a program how we are. When you have the high school kids coming in and, and you watch them just continue to, to get better and better and better. But when you look at these bodies we're bringing in, I mean, when you look at Jalen Logan Redding, you can't tell if it's Big O or it's Jalen Logan Redding, and, and they're three years apart. So the skill and the talent of our team is getting better and better and better, and we look forward to seeing what we can do. Thomas Rush moving to R. I mean, that's a move that you sit there and go, I hope that works. And you watch him play R right now, it's like, wow. So, and again, we haven't done a lot. We've had spring, and then we've, we've really kind of just had, you know, workouts and and then we've had just just today so there's not a lot but when you look at the bodies and you look at the athleticism that we're bringing in it's really exciting so again uh we want to continue to reload each year the best way we possibly can and it's always through recruiting and not taking shortcuts it's with those high school bodies and building them up and giving them a chance to play early and fail and grow and eventually they grow up all right thank you coach let's go to blake from the daily gopher hi blake Hey, BJ, uh, so you lost most of spring practice due to COVID-19. Um, what sort of challenges does that create for the team? And is that in any way a factor in how you structure uh, your fall camp practices? Yeah, I think it goes back to what Chip said, you know. I mean, it, it definitely this, – this is a game that you, we prepare from January all the way through August to, to, to play. And there's a lot of reasons why you do that. Uh, a lot of that time was taken away from us, right? And then it becomes back on the players of what you can do to, one, be safe, but also do everything you can possibly volunteer-wise to, to work out and optional to do what you want and work out the way you need to be able to work out. So it comes down to that trust issue, right? And, and then when you get here, you got to see and evaluate where your teammate, team is as fast as you can through the time you get those workouts in the summer with them. Uh, and then you got to go to work. And, and I think that's the biggest thing right now is just taking one day at a time, knowing where we're at, evaluating where we're at, and not putting the cart before the horse because their safety is, is my biggest uh, concern always. And I'm not just talking COVID-19. I'm talking about the, the, the physical fitness, the strength, the conditioning that we value so much in our program, as many programs do around the country, as all programs do around the country. And it's making sure that they're ready to take the next right step before you actually go. You can't go to step four before you get to step one. You got to take one step at a time throughout this. And that's what we're doing. Thank you, coach. We'll go to uh, Ari Wasserman with the athletic. Hey coach. Um, I know yeah. that building a football program is kind of a chicken and the egg thing. You know, you need to, the talent to win, but the talent wants to see winning. Um, you guys have done, I guess, uh, following the uh, Western Michigan plan a little bit, presenting that to the players, but you know, after going um, winning 11 games last year and, you know, doing what you guys did, it seems like that's having a positive impact on your current recruiting class. How are things going in terms of the talent accumulation phase of the building of this program? And how have you guys been able to build a program if you might not have had exactly what you want coming into it? Does that make sense? Oh, it definitely does. I, I think what you're getting at is, you know, we went from five wins our first year and now we've won 11 and ranked in the top 10 and now we're preseason number 18 or whatever we are. Um, you know, I would say that only goes so far. I think what that does is allows people to trust what you're doing. Uh, and trust comes down, as I said, to three things. Uh, Kevin Eastman in the book, Why the Best are the Best, time, consistency, and proof. We've had time here. We've had three years of work, right? And it is what it is. We went from five wins to seven to 11. So there's time to show what this program can do. Not only that, what we were able to do at Western Michigan from one and 11 all the way to 13 and one. There's, there's time. There's also consistency built in this and the consistencies over a long period of time. Again, one and 11, 13 and one, five and seven to 11 and two. There's that consistency of not only just on the field, but we're talking about every year at Western Michigan or academics, a GPA always went up as an average. Now at Minnesota, we have a three, five, six average GPA and we won 11 games and it's consistent every year. It's continued to go up. And you look at our players, the type of caliber people we're bringing in, they're not perfect, but they're really elite young men. 
and they're striving to be perfect. Do they make mistakes? You bet, like we all do. But they're, they're learning as they continue to go through that. And we're focusing on the kids that as young men, again, that, that then see the proof and say, okay, I know that works. And I can, I can see that program becoming a blue blood. And they're starting to become a blue blood and, and connecting those days of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And that's what we want to continue to do. We want young people who value their whole life, academically, athletically, socially, spiritually. Uh, we want young people who feel that Minnesota can win a national championship one day. And everything we do is at a national championship level. And we're striving to become the best developmental program in the country. You know, the way we recruit, again, everybody has their own philosophies. It's what we do. Maybe not everybody agrees with it. You know, we go 95% and the majority of what we do is through the high school route and develop them from freshman all the way through their senior year or when they leave after their true sophomore year when they're allowed to. Um, but to provide the most elite college football experience, experience on and off the field that we possibly can. So I think it's a combination of all that. Uh, but again, when you win 11 games, it opened people's doors and opened people's eyes. But, but then you still got to have things. They're not just going there because you won 11 games. I mean, that has nothing to do with them. At the end of the day, they weren't there. But they want to see it consistently built over time. And they want to know when they get there, can I continue to sustain that? Um, and again, sign a new seven-year contract, which we're very proud to do. Helps with that, I hope, too. And the cultural sustainability we have in our program. I think that all helps. So, and then having your players talk really positively about your program and, and be advocates of your program. And, and not only that, boosters and alumni, it, it, it's a team effort. All right, let's go Thanks back to Chip. Thanks for the question. Uh, thank you both. Let's go back to uh, Chip Scoggins with Star Tribune. Hey, PJ, just want to get your thoughts on that September schedule. <laughs> You know, I, I think that uh, when I was interviewed, I think Dave called it, a, a, you know, a, a daunting schedule. I think that was his quote, uh, opportunistic, right? Um, when I look at what we have in front of us, I mean, we have three rivalry games within the first four games. Uh, it's an opportunistic schedule. Uh, I think everybody looks at it that way. It's exciting to be able to at least even see a schedule for everybody involved. You know, whether we ever get to that or not, I mean, that's still TBD, right? To be determined. But when you look at it, it gets everybody really excited. Uh, because it's unique. It's different. Uh, you got to be ready to roll right out of the gates and you're going at Michigan State right away. And co everybody knows Coach Tucker's experience in the National Football League and the type of coach he really is. And then you got the three rivalry games and then so on and so forth. And we look at the caliber of coaches and the caliber of players in our league that continues to rise. Uh, it's very, very challenging schedule. All right. Thank you, Coach. Let's get back. What I love about it, though, Chip, on the other side of like the business side of it, it's, it's very flexible. I mean, whoever, I know Kevin Warren and his whole staff could deserve a ton of credit in the Big Ten because it is genius how you put it together. You got flexibility to bump it back. You got flexibility within the season to be able to move things around based on what happens. And it gives us our best shot. All right. Thank you, Coach. Let's go back to Meg Ryan, Star Tribune. PJ, I have kind of a, another two-part question for you. Um, the first part is, uh, are you anticipating any more players from your team opting out of this season? And then kind of in reference to that, what has been your reaction this summer to seeing so many players and college athletes kind of be able to find their voice, whether it be protesting racial injustice after George Floyd or, you know, the Big yep. Ten United, um, their open letter that they published about, you know, wanting to take care of, make sure their well-being is taken care of. And right. I'm just kind of curious how you felt about the players finding their voices in that way that's maybe been different than the past. Yeah, well, I can't predict uh, who will opt out, who won't opt out, but I can tell you this, I'll support them either way. And then as for your second question, um, you know, Mark Coyle and I have talked at length about all of these things that have continued to happen. Uh, and, you know, just like any student athlete, we're proud of them for using their platforms, right? Uh, as all of our student athletes have the option to be able to do that. So, um, you know, we're just going to continue to support our student athletes any way we possibly can and be there for them. Uh, and again, do everything we can to support them as they use their platform. All right. Thank you, coach. Thank you, Meg. Let's go to Andy Greeter and then we'll take one more after Andy. So Andy, go ahead. PJ, as you guys prepare for September 5th, there are guys like Braylon Oliver, Cam Wiley, uh, two potential starters uh, preparing to be available and what's their health status like? Yeah, I, I tell you what, Cam Wiley's looking really good, uh, it, you know, just in terms of his body and what he did in the offseason. Talk about a young man who's, who, who's coming back uh, from a season that he was redshirted. And, and then when you have time off, you just never know 
uh, what's going to be able to happen. And then uh, with Braylon, you know, he adds into this linebacking core that I think is getting a lot better. You know, and when you look at it, you lose Kamal Martin, you lose Thomas Barber. And, you know, we had Blake Cashman a few years ago. And you're starting to look around of like, who's going to step in and who's going to step up. And you look at Mar Mariano Sori Marin, who played in a lot of games for us last year and, you know, did a tremendous job uh, beating a lot of big time teams. So, you know, the linebacking core is something that's going to continue uh, to be a competition throughout the entire fall camp. But there's going to be a lot of guys that play, Andy, a lot of guys that play. Are they healthy and practicing? Uh, Cam Wiley is practicing. Um, Braylon is not as of today. Thanks. You bet. All right, we'll finish with Matthew Kennedy from the Minnesota Daily. Go ahead, Matthew. Hi, Coach Fleck. Um, okay. I was just wondering how, um, with Bateman opting out, how changes in the offensive scheme are going to be for you guys this year with, Ottman Bell and Demetrius Douglas in previous years being more in a slot and Bateman was more of a go up and get it guy deep threat. Does that change with what's happened this week? Anything that you guys are going to run your offense um, going early in the season against Michigan State? Yeah, I mean, we're going to evolve how our players evolve, right? Uh, I mean, if we have to use more of the tight end position, we'll do that. We got to use more of the wideouts, we'll do that. Uh, but, you know, Chris Altman Bell uh, made a ton of plays for us last year. And so did Demetrius Douglas. Those guys have played a lot of football, right? They can play – think about them. They can play any position, right? So all of our receivers are taught in a schematic way. They're taught an NFL passing game in a very schematic way, right? So they have to have the ability to play every position and move around. Now, we're their best. We're going to do everything we can to keep them around those types of positions. But they've got to know it all. And that's what makes us very flexible, whether that's our tight ends or whether that's the other wide receivers and Seth Green uh, or Clay Geary or the two freshmen, uh, or other guys, you know, the Brock Annexteads. It's going to be a, a wide receiver by committee. Uh, and my, that, again, we, who knows? We might even be better as a wide receiving core. You just never know uh, as a whole, right? Because it's, not, it's going to be the sum of all parts this year, right? And, and that's okay because we've got a lot of talented players that are very, very selfless. Right. And also in that wide receiver room, are you guys, uh, is just the feel still confident about this year? I mean, I know Bateman might've been a leader in that, um, you know, in that group of wide receivers, is the feeling still like really confident going into the season? Oh, one thing that we do, we recruit a lot of confident players. Uh, yeah. and, and sometimes when a guy like Rashad Bateman moves on, they know that there's, you know, like I said, 78% of our catches are out there to be caught by someone and they're all competitors and they're all confident and they all think they should come to them. And that's a good problem to have when you have very confident wide receivers, uh, but also very selfless at the same time. And I think that's a great combination to have. Confident, but selfless. Thank you. All right. I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank you for your time, Coach. And we'll set another one of these up soon. So thank you Look all very much. Look forward to it. Row the boat, Sky Imago. Go for it. See you, everybody.